Hello, my name is Nicole, and this is my video response to week 4 of the Critical Praxis vlog. I am very excited that this week's topic is new media because my research lies at the intersections of performance studies and new media. Teaching, however, is my heart, the thing that sustains me. Pete Rarebo writes in his essay Occupy the Digital that teaching is a moral act, both in terms of our course content and also in terms of how we cultivate relationships with our students. I agree, and as a critical pedagogue, I believe that new media might provide us with a framework of ethics with which to approach our scholarship and role as teachers in a new way. This logic is called open source. Jeffrey Schnapp and collaborators wrote in their Digital Humanities Manifesto that the digital is the realm of the open lock, open source, open resources, open doors. Anything that attempts to close this space should be recognized for what it is, the enemy, the development of the technology that gave birth to the internet as we know it is founded on the principle of sharing. Open source is based on an ideology of share alike, in which the means of production are available to all, to be built upon, added to, improved, and disseminated. Developers working in open source work together, giving each other their code, their designs, and their ideas. The creators and hobbyists have access to this information as well, often adding to the mellow in creative and unexpected ways. This is how we get things like Fiery Fox and its add-ons or Wikipedia. This spirit of openness gave birth to the internet and continues to make leaps forward in our software, hardware, and ways of conceiving what new media can be and do. The companies who have rejected this principle have certainly made money and risen to dominance, but they have also begun to foreclose on formats and software that allow for greater access to media production by a greater number of people such as Apple's War on Flash which is slowly killing a community of the animators and web designers. Perhaps we can learn something as critical pedagogues from the logic of open source so that our teaching and scholarship too can be the realm of the open lock and the open door. First of all, let's look more closely at the definition of open source. The open source initiative makes several things clear in their definition. One of these things is that open source forbids discrimination, whether that be discrimination against people or groups, or even fields of endeavor. In that sense, open source calls for an approach that respects and learns from interdisciplinary work in multiple perspectives. It values disparate ideas, because this ethic is founded on the knowledge that diversity leads to discovery. As teachers and scholars, we would be wise to embrace this ethic, both in terms of our research and our pedagogy. Sometimes our students can teach us remarkable things, but if we've already decided not to listen, we won't learn and grow. A second part of the definition has to do with access to the source code. Any software or program released under open source must include its source code, the means of its own production, so that others may learn from it, modify it, or use parts of it in other contexts to do something totally new. Though we may not have literal source code, aside perhaps from our DNA, we can expose the means of production. That is, we can talk about how and why we approach our teaching. Why are we asking them to do the things we ask them to do? What are the institutional constraints we work under? We should be able to engage in conversations with our students about both institutional successes and failures, and our own successes and failures as teachers in the classroom. Perhaps my favorite part of the definition of open source is free distribution. This is all about access, and has important implications for critical pedagogues. For me, it means that we need to seriously consider alternative methods of publishing. Now I know that the institutions we work in require us to have so many publications in specific journals, but why should we limit ourselves? This YouTube channel is a perfect example of open source scholarship. It is freely available and searchable. There are other ways to get our work out there too, like blogs, personal websites, or journals that do not sit behind paywalls, like limonalities.net. These kinds of freely published and freely accessed venues extend us out of the ivory tower and even out of our classrooms, where we can engage in public intellectualism and pedagogy. The best part about all this, 
though, is that open source thrives on creativity and asks us to look for creative solutions to our needs and struggles and creative uses of the tools at our disposal. What a wonderful thing to ask of our students as well. In the end, I think open source provides a dynamic and important ethical framework about how to approach our jobs as researchers and teachers. New media has given us this new way of thinking about what our scholarship and pedagogy might look like, outside the bounds of the institution and across disciplines, in networked and dialogic relationships with our students, who we might begin to see as co-researchers and co-teachers, full collaborators in the process of their education and the growth of the discipline. Well, that's all I've got for today. Thank you for taking the time to listen, and I look forward to hearing more from and participating more with the subscribers and collaborators involved in this project. Bye for now.